Good to have everyone. Um, yeah, like I said before, my name is Declan Beto. I work out of the Buchanan Center here at the Edmonton office. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sircant. Dr. Jacob Sircant is currently a Movement Disorders Fellow with Dr. Ba and Dr. Kemisholi at the University of Alberta. He obtained his undergraduate and medical education at the University of Toronto. He then completed his neurology training at the University of Alberta. His primary research interests involve diffusion tensor imaging in movement disorders, especially Parkinson disease. Welcome, Dr. Sir Khan. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited, actually. This is, uh, used this, uh, this, I was saying before, I used this once before and I'm not in a webinar setting, so I'm pretty excited to see how this works. Um, it looks like everything is running smoothly, so um, might as well just start. So uh, in addition to, um, uh, to kind of, uh, doing the fellowship. Actually, as a resident, uh, I, I did a month in, of sleep in Ontario as an elective. This was actually before I had had, um, you know, like the, 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 the idea to pursue movement disorders as a fellowship crystallized. So, so I had a little bit of interest in sleep as well. So this, this ties in nicely. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. So, uh, might as well just start. So sleep essentially is, uh, as you all know, pretty important. Um, uh, it's always nice to start with kind of a, a definition. And so sleep is really just a recurring state where your body and your mind goes through periods of inactivity. And um, uh, the exact function to sleep is not entirely known, but um, as we, uh, what we do know is that it's, uh, critical to energy restoration. It's as uh, probably most of us have now heard, especially with this coronavirus thing, immunity is very important when it comes to sleep. So having a good night's sleep improves that. Um, things like learning, growth, and development are all uh, critically affected by sleep. Um, and importantly to Parkinson's is that there's an element of clearing waste products. And uh, because um, we're starting to think that Parkinson's disease, there's a little bit, there's essentially an involvement of these abnormal misfolded proteins, um, you know, that, that can't be cleared. This idea that sleep is important for clearing waste products is particularly relevant. Um, and so sleep and Parkinson's disease, there's several things um, that are important here. And so good night sleep in Parkinson's disease has, has been found to actually improve a, a wide variety of symptoms. And so one thing is motor control. Now motor control in, in, in sleep, um, there's, this, there's this phenomenon called sleep effect or sleep benefit where um, people will say that they wake up and they actually feel on without taking their medications. And uh, that occurs for several hours after they wake up. Um, it's, it's also related to the development of dyskinesia. So um, there's some thinking that sleep will actually replenish dopamine stores. Now it's a little bit, um, I mean, when I was preparing for this talk, uh, essentially I dug a little bit deeper into that. And so there are some studies that suggest that it might be just subjective. Um, Although based on what people have been telling me when I've been doing the fellowship in clinic, it does seem like both their motor control is improved, but also if they have dyskinesias, their dyskinesias are related to how much sleep they get and whether that's related to the sleep benefit or whether it's just related to, you know, improvement of dyskinesia control of sleep is a little bit unclear. Um, the other thing that we do know is that sleep and Parkinson's disease, if you have a good night's sleep, it's going to improve your cognition. You're going to have more energy. There's going to be better balance. And as again, I mentioned before, the dyskinesias um, can be affected by, uh, by improved sleep. So across the board, studies have found that poor sleep quality uh, is related to poor quality of life in Parkinson's. Um, that's pretty much every study review paper that talks about sleep will have that phrase somewhere. And so, um, uh, you know, how, in, 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 being able to optimize sleep in Parkinson's is really important. And the problem is that as we age, uh, there are some natural changes that are unrelated to Parkinson's that occur in sleep. So what happens is, uh, you know, people's sleep becomes more fragmented. So they, they tend to wake up more frequently 
regardless. And the slow wave sleep, which is the um, kind of the, the deep um, kind of sleep phase, becomes shorter and shorter. Um, and so the kind of sleep becomes less and less restorative over time. And so people actually do tend to sleep longer and longer too, just because that, that deep sleep phase is shorter and shorter. So on top of that, you also add in Parkinson's disease and you have a whole variety of different changes that are occurring and a variety of symptoms that are going to interfere with sleep. So, um, so kind of you have two processes going on and being able to to kind of optimize the Parkinson's part is at least going to be able to get you back to kind of the, the sleep quality that you potentially had before. So a big, uh, probably actually I mean, the biggest, the biggest component of the talk is going to be really talking about insomnia. Um, there's going to be a little bit about excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue. Um, but for the most part, we're going to be talking about primarily about um, problems sleeping. And Insomnia in general can be kind of divided into three categories. And so the first part is really sleep initiation. So that's problems falling asleep. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that can occur. And then sleep maintenance, insomnia, which is problem staying asleep. And then there's this phenomenon called early morning awakenings. Um, and it's related to sleep maintenance. Um, it's more, more of a, it's a slightly different phenomenon where, where people just kind of wake up early and they just can't fall back asleep, which is, I mean, related to sleep maintenance, but it's, it's more of a kind of a one-time thing. You just kind of wake up and then you can't get back to sleep, whereas sleep maintenance is more of a fragmented uh, sleep phenomenon. And um, depending on which uh, kind of which uh, society you, you go to or which you know definitions you look at some people add that insomnia has to have impairment of daytime functioning um that's a little bit unclear and and closely tied into uh in, impairments in daytime functioning is this idea of actually non-restorative sleep so sometimes people will actually have um issues with sleep maintenance but their daytime functioning will actually be fine and primarily that's related to the fact that their sleep will be restorative despite um you know having problems with sleep maintenance or despite having problems with initiating sleep um and uh, in parkinson's disease insomnia will get worse as the disease progresses and so um about a third of individuals already kind of have some form of insomnia at a given point in time just kind of if you take a, a snapshot at uh, 100, 100 people with Parkinson's disease, about a, th a third of those people will have some issues with sleep. And then if you follow, there was a study that was done when you look at people over five years and you kind of follow them three points in time, that number rises depending on the type of sleep problem to between 54 and 80%. So, um, uh, so sleep issues and insomnia and Parkinson's is very common. And difficulty maintaining sleep appears to be the most common form. And pers just personal experience, that seems to be the case, is that you know, people don't tend not to have problems falling asleep, but then there's a whole myriad things that wake them up, and then they can't, back to, can't get back to sleep. Um, uh, so reasons for insomnia in PD. And so um, the kind of the first, there, there's a whole bunch of reasons for why people can have problems falling asleep. And so... Uh, kind of the most obvious one is actually just not having good motor control at night. Now, the textbook answer for things like tremor and stiffness and slowness is that these actually improve when you sleep. Um, uh, and that by and large is true, is that if we were to kind of take anybody who has a significant tremor and we put them to sleep, whether they actually fall asleep or whether we do that pharmacologically, their tremor should improve. And that's that's really the case actually for most movement disorders is, you know, tremor, hyperkinetic movements will all improve. But the problem is that, um, you know, during the night, so we're always waking up, um, you know, to a shift position, or if you have some of these other conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, the breathing will wake you up. And then when you wake up, that's when your Parkinson's symptoms kick in again. Um, so, so even though when you're sleeping, the Parkinson's isn't a problem, you know, when you have these short arousals that you don't remember, the Parkinson's symptoms can kick in. And if you're, you know, if the symptoms are not well controlled at night, that can then wake people up. And so, um, you know, 
if you can't really turn, um, then you're not able to get into a comfortable position. Um, repositioning is important, right? Our, our brain will actually tell us to reposition so that, you know, um, if we're like cutting off, accidentally cutting off blood flow to a limb, that happens to you. Sometimes you wake up and then you, you know, you kind of wake up, you feel that your, um, your hand or whatever is kind of numb and then you turn, right? And the problem is that in Parkinson's, if you're not, um, if you don't have, if you're not, if you're not on at that point in time, that's obviously going to wake you up and then you won't be able to get back to sleep. And dystonia oftentimes is also this off phenomenon and dystonia can be very painful. So then, you know, if you wake up and you have a cramp in your foot, then that's going to kind of completely, completely, um, uh, completely wake you up and then you can't, back to, can't, can't get back to sleep. So, um, so just control of motor symptoms is the reason for why people have problems sleeping. Nocturia or uh, essentially getting up to the bathroom is also another frequent reason. And uh, sometimes pain is another problem that can be related to, again, motor symptoms. It can be independent of that. Um, psychiatric factors. So uh, depression and anxiety make, uh, make insomnia worse. There's also this phenomenon called psychophysiological insomnia, which is essentially just uh, um, kind of a phenomenon where, where people are either clock watching or they're um, very anxious and they just can't back to, get back to sleep. And it's kind of a vicious cycle. They're anxious about not falling asleep. That makes them more anxious and they can't fall asleep. And, and so there are psychiatric factors that factor into insomnia. And then medications can obviously make uh, can affect how how people sleep and some behavioral changes are important too. So especially in Parkinson's, um, there's uh, there's kind of an underlying change that occurs. Uh, so you people will start taking more daytime naps because they're not as aroused, like their their arousal levels are lower. But they're also more sedentary during the daytime because of their symptoms too. And so this kind of primes your brain to stop seeing nighttime really as a time for sleep and that kind of that circadian and that clock that internal clock that we all have um, becomes becomes affected and then there's some related conditions that obviously can cause insomnia such as restless legs obstructive sleep apnea and REM sleep behavior disorder and i'll talk about all of those so medications wise there's there was a review article that i looked at and about you know, they, they looked at all these different case reports and studies and they found that 19 medications are found to be associated with insomnia. And one of them is actually cinnamide itself, um, which is interesting because I think uh, sometimes I've started people on long acting cinnamide at night and it's actually helped their sleep. So I, I think because, because insomnia is such a varied phenomenon, even in Parkinson's, I mean, across the board, but especially in Parkinson's, um, you know, some people will actually find that these medications improve their sleep, and I think some people will find that their med these medications will make the sleep worse. Um, Tolcaptone, the reason I, it's not on the market, but the reason I put that in specifically is that it's closely related to intact bone, which is on the market. And um, the study, the, when they were looking at all these studies, these medications, the, the you know, pergolide, per uh, pergolide, rosagiline, intact bone, and antidine. Um, they weren't statistically significant, um, but because if tolcaptone is, then I suspect intacapone has some issues um, or some kind of effect on insomnia too. And then definitely antidepressants such as uh, sertraline, fluoxetine, venlafaxine, these are all medications that are wakefulness promoting. So they definitely have uh, an impact on, on insomnia. And then some of the actual the cognitive medications like denepazil or rosestigmine that we use also can, can impact uh, insomnia. So, so this slide really is um, kind of points to the fact that if you do have problems falling asleep, one of the things that your physician can look at is actually medications and whether starting a medication has actually um, changed your sleep patterns. Um, and then it really becomes a discussion to see whether the medication is doing something and whether, you know, it's, it's worth stopping it or worth changing to a different medication. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's still a balancing act, right? I mean, there's, I suspect there's a reason why, why these medications get started. And so um, the physician is kind of hoping to treat a symptom. But if it's causing some sort of side effect, such as insomnia, then, then there has to be a discussion that, that, that will kind of I'll look at all the kind of pros and cons of, of each approach to determine which one's the best for you. 
Um, and so, yeah, so what can we do to treat insomnia? So it obviously depends on the underlying cause. And uh, I, I list the pharmacologic uh, things, they, so medications that can be used. But I, I mean, I think I'm going to talk a bit more about the non-pharmacological things because they really are things that you can do yourself. And um, the other thing that uh, you can always ask your doctor is refer you to a sleep specialist. Um, I mean, there's, there's a good amount of information that can be uh, gleaned from like a level one or level three sleep study, even level three. So, so level one sleep studies are essentially sleep studies where you actually go into the hospital or you go into a facility and you sleep there and then they monitor different things. Level three, essentially it's like a kit that they send or you take home and then you just kind of you sleep with, with it on and then, and then they take that information. It's not as precise as the level one, but there's always good information that can be, um, that can come out of these studies that can help um, treat insomnia because there's some things that are, uh, that the, for which the sleep study is absolutely required and some things, you know, you don't necessarily need the sleep study, but, but that is an option again. And, and if, you know, you're, you're finding that there are issues with your sleep and you've tried some of these non-pharmacologic things, then, then, then again, another option is to actually get your doctor to refer you to a sleep specialist. Um, and that can potentially be helpful too. They tend to have a lot more experience um, dealing with a variety of different sleep disorders, you know, in the context of Parkinson's and outside of the context. So their kind of armamentarium of, of things that they can do to try to help your symptoms is much more broad um, uh, than, than probably than even most movement disorder specialists do, right? So non-pharmacological options, the, the biggest thing that, that I think pretty much during that month of, of sleep elective that I did in residency, it's all about sleep hygiene is the first step. And so things like keeping the bedroom dark, quiet, and cool. And the reason is if you have light on or it's, or it's, or it's loud, it's gonna wake you up. And lowered body temperatures are actually sleep promoting. So that's why cool uh, bedroom temperatures are better. Um, the bedroom is strictly for sleep. And uh, people say like sleep and sex. Uh, the idea here is that um, you want to train your mind and your body to recognize the bed essentially just as a place for sleep rather than, you know, you're working or you're watching TV, your body and your mind are getting used to this idea that you're doing other things in the, in the bed. Um, and so if you essentially just uh, use the bed as for sleep, that's going to kind of you know, kind of get you into a routine for, for just for using the bed as sleep. And so if, people who aren't able to fall asleep. Let's say you go to bed and you can't fall asleep. The recommendation is you then usually actually get up instead of lying there awake. Because again, it's kind of priming your brain and your, your mind and your body to just kind of recognize the bed as a place where you lie down rather than sleep. Um, this idea of turning off light um, at least an hour before bed. And, and so this is all related to the fact that our brains are, are primarily the, the internal clock is, is, is based on uh, light. So if you are um, seeing bright light that's being shown in your face at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. or whatever, when uh, your brain is starting kind of seeing, essentially seeing a source of light and thinking that it's still daylight. And so turning off all these things are important. I mean, there are some features on some cell phones where you can turn off blue light um, because blue light tends to be most, um, like it's, it's the thing that your brain really seeks out the most in determining whether it's daytime or nighttime, but really any light is going to, is going to cause that issue. Um, so I would just say kind of turning off, thing, uh, you know, light sources or direct light sources an hour before is important. You see avoiding stimulants, same thing with eating meals. All of those are really stimulants, essentially things that will keep you awake. Uh, alcohol, the interesting part about alcohol is, you know, it is, it will get you to sleep. But the problem is that it, it will then affect the sleep architecture. So all those different phases of sleep um, will be affected and it actually doesn't help promote sleep. So it might get you to sleep, but then you, the, rest of the, the rest of the night is not going to be optimal. Um, same thing with work and exercise. These are again, things that kind of tell your brain and your mind and your body that it's not time for sleep. So you want to avoid things like work and exercise. And you just kind of engage in relaxing activities, kind of slow everything down. And you have to obviously give yourself enough time for sleep as well. And this idea of minimizing daytime napping is, 
um, is interesting because it's actually a recommendation to treat excessive daytime sleepiness, which can be a result of insomnia. But at the same time, the idea behind this recommendation is that if you are sleeping during the day, again, that's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's breaking down that boundary between daytime and nighttime. And again, the body is starting to see daytime as a time for sleep rather than seeing it as a, as a time for activity. And conversely, because you kind of, starting to sleep during the day the night doesn't become as important of a of a of a time for sleep so so me possibly minimizing daytime lapse can also help kind of consolidate all the sleep time at night and some other things uh so cognitive behavioral therapy um you can actually do on your own um so it's usually provided by psychologists and it's essentially this um it's a system where you're looking at uh, kind of attitudes towards sleep and behaviors around sleep and recognizing things that don't really help promote sleep and then trying to get rid of those. And so usually psychologists are the ones that will kind of help. Uh, but there are some psychiatrists that do CBT. Uh, I know especially the, the psychiatrist at our clinic in Edmonton does do some cognitive behavioral therapy. I don't think he does it for insomnia specifically. He does it more for anxiety and depression, but but psychiatrists do them occasionally. And I included the website for the Canadian Sleep Society. So, if, uh, I mean, you can obviously do a Google search and, 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 and I, I track there's, it's actually quite easy to find people who are, who are doing CBTI. Um, but for, for kind of a more official reference, I probably would go to the Canadian Sleep Society and ask them. And then there is actually a free app that I just quickly looked. Uh, it's called CBTI Coach. Um, I think it's free because I downloaded it and I didn't, I didn't have to pay for it. Um, but there are other online modules. So, so it is actually something that you can do even on your own. Um, and you don't necessarily need to go to a psychologist. Uh, there is actually uh, this thing called bright light therapy. And again, the reason I'm saying you can do this on Zoom is because there are light boxes that, that can be purchased. And um, especially in Edmonton, um, or the more north you go, um, the less light you tend to have at night. So this is actually used for something called seasonal affective disorder. And there was actually a trial or like a study that looked at bright light therapy. This was specifically with this, uh, with light intensity a thousand lux for one hour, twice a day. And it improved daytime sleepiness and it actually improved insomnia symptoms, uh, both both uh, groups, so the bright light therapy and the dim red light therapy. So any sort of light really during the daytime actually helped. Um, so, so that is again something that you don't really like medications, that is something that could be tried. So essentially you're trying to do one hour twice a day, morning and early evening. So not too close to sleep time, but morning and early evening. They did that for 14 days and they found that people's sleep was improved too. Um, and then exercise, um, it's again a little bit paradoxical because if you exercise too close to your sleep, you're going to have issues. But exercise in general is, is great for Parkinson's and I encourage everybody to, to exercise. But um, there were several studies that were looked at. I mean, there's one that was done in hospital. So it's a little bit hard to probably take the, the things that they did in that study and apply it uh, at home. But there was a study that looked at resistance training. So just kind of simple resistance training exercises for an hour twice a week, again, improved sleep. And things like Tai Chi or Qi Gong essentially can, can help, um, can help uh, sleep as well, right? Now, the, one th the reason I mentioned deep brain stimulation to be complete is that there, when people have deep brain stimulation, there are papers and studies that, that suggest that it helps improve sleep, but it's actually not an indication. So, um, so, so we generally do deep brain stimulation for motor control, um, but as a kind of as a side effect, quote unquote, it actually helps sleep too. Um, and in terms of pharmacological options, so these are now medications. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of obviously prescription medications, um, but things that can be bought over essentially over the counter is melatonin. Now, mel melatonin is, um, uh, I mean. Melatonin, people tell me different things about it. I mean, there, there is study evidence. So there are, people have looked at it and, uh, you know, between three and 50 milligrams has shown to improve sleep. Um, but then there's a group of people that actually says it does absolutely nothing for them. Um, so, so just personal experience, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. I wonder whether um, it's, it's related to the fact that, uh, especially when you're using it to help you 
go to sleep. It's not actually initiating sleep. People treat it as a sleeping pill. And so they take it right at bedtime. And the thing with melatonin is that um, the way it works in your body is that as essentially the less light you see, the levels start ramping up. And, and this happens hours before you're actually going to go to bed. And so there's kind of this gradual increase and then the levels stay relatively high at night and then they fall in the morning and that, that fall actually wakes you up. And what you want to do is actually want to mimic that kind of gradual ramp up. So if you take it right when you're going to bed, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to be absorbed. And so you're not really mimicking that, 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 that kind of that, 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 uh, that peak, right? So you actually want to take it about an hour and a half beforehand. Now there are other formulations of it. And as far as I can tell, there are really no studies looking at things like short acting, long acting, or dual action melatonin, which is essentially short acting and long acting in one pill. But what essentially what I, I've been taught is if you want to use the short acting for going to sleep, long acting for maintaining sleep, and dual action if you have both issues, falling asleep and maintaining sleep. Um, the, uh, so it's something you can actually pick up over the counter. The nice part is it's essentially a natural, a natural substance. It's something your body already creates. Um, the reason I put L-tryptophan, some patients have actually looked uh, to um, herbal supplements, and that's usually the way it works, is these herbal supplements actually have L-tryptophan, which is amino acid that then becomes melatonin. So these herbal supplements that have L-tryptophan are essentially a form of melatonin. They, it's, it's also the same reason why things like milk uh, will make you sleepy because milk has a lot of L-tryptophan. So, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the reason why I put L-tryptophan there. Uh, but melatonin is something that definitely can be tried and the side effects really are gonna be related to the dose. And so if you find yourself being groggy in the morning, this probably means that the dose is too high. So you just kind of have to scale back. Um, I've used Cinemet CR, uh, which is essentially a controlled re uh, release Cinemet. They don't have um, Prolopa controlled release, but there is a controlled release Cinemet. And um, so most of the people that I've actually started it on say it helps. So I, I was a little bit surprised uh, when I actually saw that there was a study that said it didn't, it wasn't actually better than placebo. Um, so, uh, I mean, the Parkinson's Foundation actually on the little document for sleep does, they do suggest using it. And I think it really depends on, um, on what the problem is. So if you, for example, have, you know, if, if your sleep is affected by something like REM sleep behavior disorder or vivid dreams, then increasing the amount of cinema you take at night is probably not going to help. But you know, if it's something like dystonia, it could. So I, I wonder whether that study was actually negative because kind of everybody was lumped into the same group rather than looking at the people where low levels of dopamine are the issue. But it, again, it's something, especially if you find yourself waking up and you're having all, lots of off time, off dystonia. Um, I mean, in some cases it's actually worked when people can't really recognize why they're waking up. And that might be related to the fact that there are there is study a data suggesting it actually improves obstructive sleep apnea symptoms. So if you have sleep apnea that's waking you up and that's that's what's waking you up and you're not you know you, you're not recognizing that it's sleep apnea, the cinema CR has actually been found have, have found to help there. Um, so there's actually really good study data about all these dopamine agonists that I mentioned. So that's ritigitine, promethazol, pinerol, apomorphine. Duodopa is not a dopamine agonist, but essentially all of these kind of more continuous forms, that, that definitely helps, but there, there are some obvious side effects with those medications. Um, and then there's kind of more traditional medications, which are essentially just sedatives. So things like zopiclone, clonazepam, and then some antidepressants. The antidepressants tend to be better and the reason is, again, zopiclone and clonazepam, they're like alcohol. Um, they actually bind to the same receptor. Um, and so what they're going to do is they're going to make you sleepy and you're going to fall asleep, but then sleep architecture is affected. So, you know, you're going to have less restorative, slow wave sleep. Whereas with the antidepressants, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work that way, is they don't really affect the sleep architecture as much. Um, so that's why I would most of the time I've seen mirtazapine or trazodone used because they, they are also sedating, but they don't, they don't have that um, kind of effect of affecting your sleep in a negative way. 
Um, and so we'll talk about, a little bit about each of the, the related disorders. So REM sleep behavior disorder, um, it's quite common in Parkinson's. Uh, essentially, it occurs in a stage called the REM. If you ever wonder what REM stands for, it's called rapid eye movement. And the idea is actually when you fall asleep, uh, there's th four stages. And so the first two stages are, are a little bit lighter. So the first stage is, is just kind of very light. The second stage is a little bit deeper. And then there's a st stage three, which is the slow wave sleep, where, where you get these very large, what they literally call slow waves. So the electrical activity of the brain just becomes very synchronized. And then the odd part is that after the slow wave sleep, you actually get a, a stage called REM or rapid eye movement where things, things kind of flip. The brain actually becomes more active. There's a lot of eye movement. Um, and then you have relaxation of muscles. Uh, and it's thought that this is the stage of sleep where we're dreaming. Um, and most of the time, um, the circuitry in the brainstem prevents us from actually physically acting out what we're doing in the dream. So if the first reports of this, this disorder were of people, for example, tackling things because they thought they were playing a game of football. Um, so normally that doesn't happen because there's, there's essentially a mechanism that relaxes all our muscles. And in Parkinson's, that circuitry is affected. And so then that's when people will start acting out their dreams. And it can be, um, it can be fairly uh, negligible, where it's just movement um, to like vocalizations, to, to just getting up and actually, you know, doing things. Um, and it's not so much sleepwalking because sleepwalking occurs in that slow wave phase of sleep, whereas REM sleep actually occurs in REM. So, so, so it's a little bit different. And sleepwalking, just the way the phases tend to, you know, tend to occur in, when you sleep, sleepwalking tend to occur, tends to occur earlier at night and REM sleep behavior disorder tends to occur later at night because there's more REM cycles closer to when you wake. Um, and, it's, it's actually a symptom that can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's for years even. Um, and so there are people who just have REM sleep behavior disorder and that alone increases the risk of Parkinson's. So there's probably some people that have just REM sleep behavior disorder and they don't have Parkinson's. There's gonna be a group of those people that actually have Parkinson's but they don't have the stiffness and slowness yet. And so it can occur in about 50 to 60%. And um, it's always a risk to both the patient and the bed partner. So you know, if you're going around tackling things, you're gonna, that's gonna, you know, you're gonna involuntarily hurt yourself. And then the bed partner gets struck as well, because if, you know, you're having kind of a, a violent dream where you're defending yourself, you know, then, then, then you're, if you're acting out that, then you might, you might be hitting your bed partner too. So um, again, there are medications that can help treat this, but uh, the things that you can do, so, uh, essentially try to minimize the risk of injury. So you know, the mattress gets lowered to the floor, removing any sort of sharp or dangerous objects. Um, uh, the reason I put guns is essentially because was, this was a recommendation more so from American papers. Uh, I don't know if that, that really is that relevant to Canada, but padding the furniture, pillows or cushions on the floor, essentially making sure that if you do you know, start acting out, moving, falling out of bed, then, that, then those... Um, uh, that, that can be kind of done quote unquote safely. And then in some situations, uh, you know, separate sleeping arrangements uh, need to be made. Um, and then like, melatonin and clonazepam are kind of the two, the two things. Clonazepam, ha which is essentially a benzodiazepine, has the best uh, study evidence. But melatonin, melatonin, I found actually, again, personally, that it, it helps for REM sleep behavior disorder. We started on some patients to treat insomnia. And then they found that, again, their insomnia may, have, may or may not have improved, but their REM sleep behavior disorder certainly did. And then there's actually one study that looked at the retigitine batch, um, which is a little bit interesting because I think the textbook answer for dopamine, and the more, the more dopamine you have at night, you know, the, the textbook answer is the more likely you'll have REM sleep behavior disorder, the more, the more likely you'll have vivid dreams. 
So that's interesting is that maybe there's uh, a little bit more going on than just, you know, increasing dopamine. Maybe it's uh, the fluctuations or that sort of thing is, is a big component here. So, so there was a study that looked at the retigitine, but really clonazepam and melatonin are the, the, the two big medications. Restless leg syndrome. So um, restless legs, uh, I'm, I'm sure that most people have had some sort of, uh, you know, have experienced it, but I want to go through it because uh, I find that actually when I ask about restless legs, it's, um, it's, it's actually a little bit hard for patients to describe it. And the reason is, so, so restless legs, again, is common in Parkinson's. And, and really, in order to make the diagnosis, there are four criteria. So the first one is that there's an urge to move usually the lower extremity, so usually the legs, and usually it's both legs, but it can be the arms too. And it's, it, it can sometimes be associated by an uncomfortable sensation, but not always. Essentially, it's, it's just supposed to be an urge to move. Um, and it can, be, it can be described in a variety of different ways. So like any sort of sensation that makes you move your legs counts in this criteria. So whether that's creepy, crawly, ants, worms, Pepsi Cola in the veins. I mean, I was just kind of looking through the sleep textbook that I used. They had a whole bunch of different descriptions for it. It can even be as simple as something like an ache um, and, or, or something like pain, right? But any sensation that makes you move your legs kind of counts for this criteria. And it's supposed to occur or worsen when you're resting. So that's sitting or lying down. So if it's happening when you're walking, that wouldn't be restless legs. But if you find that the instant I sit down, several minutes later, I get this urge to move, this sort of dull, achy feeling, that that fits restless legs. Um, and then it's worse in the evening or the nighttime. But over time, um, the, uh, the time period of when these symptoms start actually becomes, occurs earlier and earlier. So if it's advanced enough, so to speak, it can actually just kind of start occurring in, in the morning. And then it's improved or completely abolished by movement. Um, even, or, or things like eating or increased mental activity sometimes helps too. So, so there are people who will eat while watching a movie in the evening and the eating will actually help. So some sort of, some sort of activity, whether it's actually moving the legs or, or doing mental activity. So essentially if you have, if you have those criteria, that's restless legs. Uh, I mean, I've had some people say, you know, that there's pain in the legs, but it occurs when you're walking, and that's that's not so much restless legs. And uh, the, re, the, the there's this phenomenon called augmentation, which occurs with specific medications, and that's related to um, the symptoms getting worse with treatment or recurring earlier and earlier with time. Uh, so it is something to be aware of if you have restless legs and you're being treated with dopamine agonists. And periodically, movements of sleep um, is really just a restless leg syndrome uh, description in a sleep study. So people who have periodic limb movements of sleep oftentimes have restless legs and vice versa. So that, that just means that if you're moving at night, it probably means that you actually have restless leg syndrome. And the thing is restless leg syndrome occurs when you're awake, whereas periodic limb movements of sleep occurs when you're asleep. But the two are very closely related, if not the same thing. And there's three different forms, so to speak. So there's one that is intermittent, which is defined as less than two times per week. And this is where non-pharmacological treatments are useful. And then there's chronic, which is more than two times per week, and it's supposed to be moderate or severe. And this refractory, which um, essentially is unresponsive to medications. And, and about one in five people will have restless leg syndrome. It's actually associated again with worse sleep quality. It's not surprising if you're Oh, if your legs are bothering you, you can't get to sleep. If you have periodic movements of sleep, that might wake you up. And then it's, it's also related to anxiety and depression, which is obviously uh, also uh, related to poor sleep quality. And there are case reports of it being, again, just like REM sleep behaviors or an early sign of Parkinson's disease. Um, and the other thing to really, be with, to really be aware about is this low iron level. Um, so iron deficiency can actually be a precipitating factor. But when your physician actually kind of, well, looks at restless leg syndrome, they really should actually look at the other things too. So, I mean, really in, in Parkinson's, um, the iron deficiency is important uh, because that can, and really neuropathy too. Um, I mean, to have 
you know, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's, that's, they're, they're, you know, having both, both of them is relatively rare. So I've never seen someone who has both, but um, the idea is like, I've definitely seen people who have Parkinson's and they actually have neuropathy, which is nerve damage. Sometimes actually because uh, the cinemas that people take decreases vitamin B12 levels and decreased vitamin B12 can actually cause nerve damage. So really the things to be aware in Parkinson's is the iron deficiency, uh, neuropathy or nerve damage. And then, you know, just when we age, some people will have a component of kidney failure. And that can, again, compound restless legs. So it's not as simple as saying, okay, if Parkinson's disease is you have restless legs, there are other things that could be, you know, making the whole picture worse, including medications. So neuroleptics or medications to treat schizophrenia are a big no-no really in Parkinson's. So that tends not to be an issue. But things like antidepressants, definitely. Um or even things like prochlorperazine or metoclopramide, which actually get used in migraine. Um, those are the things that can make restless leg syndrome worse. So, so it's not just the Parkinson's. There are other things that need to be looked at. And um, things that you can do to help restless legs, exercise, stretching, um, heat or cold um, have been found to help. Uh, kind of avoiding alcohol and caffeine is more likely related to just not kind of, you don't really want to add things that keep you awake. Um, now there's these pneumatic compression devices that kind of, um, you know, compress the lower extremities and help. And, you know, if their medications are contributing, you want to get rid of those if possible too. And there is a, a list of medications. So the first three uh, really are, um, are probably the, the, really the first line. So if you have iron deficiency, uh, IV iron, or really any sort of iron supplementation is going to help. Um, IV iron tends to be the thing that has study data, but just even you know taking iron pills by mouth is going to help. And then gabapentin, uh, or pregabalin, which is a close cousin, and actually gabapentin and carbol, they all kind of work on the same receptor. That's really first line. Um, and then, you know, the Parkinson's medications should actually help restless legs, but the big thing to kind of worry about here is this phenomenon of augmentation, where the, the previous effect of these medications kind of, you know, wears off, and then the restless legs could get worse over time. And in some cases, uh, people have used opioids. Uh, for especially for if it's for treatment resistance. So if, if nothing really works, people have tried things like oxycodone and Percocet and that has helped too. Uh, and then sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing is another related, a kind of related uh, phenomenon to, um, uh, to insomnia. And so this really involves any changes in breathing um, because it's not just stopping. Um, there you, you know your breath can become shallower and that counts uh, to sleep apnea it can be related to just not the, the muscles not being told to move properly and so that's the lack of drive so that's called central sleep apnea because from the central nervous system and then obstructive sleep apnea which is essentially just related to blockage of the airways so the and in Parkinson's both occur so obstructive sleep apnea just in general is very common but then, you know, it's actually more common in Parkinson's. And then you also get this component of the central sleep apnea. Um, so uh, it can be surprising um, like how frequently people will stop breathing. Um, so the, the cutoff really in a sleep study phenomena is about 15 times an hour. Um, so that's about one every four minutes. Uh, if you do that, that counts as sleep apnea. Um, if you have symptoms, it's actually just five times. But I, I mean, I remember seeing people who, you know, stop breathing 60 times, uh, on average 60 times, in a, 60 times an hour in, when they were tested. So that means every minute their breathing is becoming, you know, changing. And, and the component of those apneas is going to wake you up. And you won't even remember it, but you're always kind of waking up. Or whether, you know, you'll, you'll get brought out from the slow wave sleep, which is the restorative part to like a lighter form of sleep. So you're always essentially kind of getting, just sleeping in a, in a kind of a light stage of sleep. So, um, so this is, this is it, it's common. So I, I think it's actually really important to look out for it too. So sleep apnea occurs in about 50% of 
Parkinson's disease, and then snoring and episodes of disordered breathing. So that's not necessarily sleep apnea, but just changes in breathing actually occurs three times more frequently in Parkinson's than it does in people who don't have Parkinson's. Um, so, so it is something that can be fixed. Uh, and, it's, and it's also related to the other um, symptoms. So there were some people, uh, I mean, I haven't ever experienced it here because I'm not starting people on CPAP. But when I was doing the sleep elective, people said you know, they were started on the on the CPAP machine, and not only did their sleep apnea improve, but the restless legs went away, or their REM sleep behavior disorder went away. So that kind of is all that that triangle: the restless legs, obstructive sleep apnea, and REM sleep behavior disorder are actually all kind of related. So in obstructive sleep apnea, as I mentioned, it's obstruction, and it tends to occur more frequently when you're relaxed. So that's REM sleep. And when you're lying uh, flat, because it's part of it's related to the jaw just kind of falling, falling backwards. Um, and uh, not only does it make the sleep worse, it can also have issue uh, effects on, you know, your heart, stroke risk, high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, which are always things you want to avoid too. Um, the symptoms are so. Sort of you know, you can't really say it's snoring. You can't really witness snoring or witness apnea. But if your bed partner says you're snoring, and they actually see you, you know, choking or stopping breathing, then that's really a good sign that obstructive sleep apnea is likely the culprit. Morning headaches, definitely something to watch out for. And if you do wake with gasping or choking, like a sensation of gasping or choking, that's another symptom of sleep apnea. And obviously, non-restorative sleep, excessive daytime sleepiness are all related. And really the big things also is that if you do have those symptoms, you know, and you're, you know, male, um, obesity, alcohol, smoking, increased age, kind of these, these anatomical factors of a kind of a short, thick neck, those all increase the likelihood that, you know, some of your insomnia is related to obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and the uh, treatment is here, you actually need to go to a sleep specialist because the diagnosis is based on the sleep study. And some, so the main treatment is, is actually this uh, CPAP machine or continuous positive airway pressure, which effectively what it does is it stents the airway open. Um, so it keeps it open and then that prevents the, the obstruction from occurring. There are other things that can be done. So if you're not having symptoms and then you know that you can observe. You don't necessarily need to do anything. There is actually a, a, what we call an anti-snore shirt. So it's, it's essentially a garment that has this like balloon in the back. And what happens is it actually prevents you from rolling onto your back. And, and then because you're not on, lying on your back, you know, we know that lying on your back worsens sleep apnea. So it prevents you from, from doing that. Other things, I mean, there's, you know, the oral or dental appliances that are supposed to keep the jaw uh, pushed forward. These are actually really expensive. Um, they were actually really expensive, even in Ontario, where the government subsidizes part of that. So, and they're not really, I don't say they're not effective. Like, there is data to suggest they're effective. But, you know, they're more expensive than the CPAP. They're not really interchangeable. Like somebody has to go and like make a mold of your jaw. So, so they're, not as, uh, they're not as convenient actually as the CPAP. And then surgery, again, it, it works for a small proportion of people. And it's, the one thing is that it's, it's uh, irreversible. So, so really the CPAP machine is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the choice of treatment. And then obviously things like weight loss and sediment CR can also help. Uh, the big thing really with the CPAP machine is people don't really like the mask, but um, there are a wide variety of different mask forms now. So there's one that just kind of goes on the nose. They even have these just nasal prongs. Like they, I think every year they come out with a new different model that's supposed to be more comfortable. Right? So part, part of the process is also getting used to it too, which takes a little bit of time. And then sleep apnea. There's a central form of sleep apnea, which also occurs uh, in PD. There's a little bit less data on whether it actually is increased in Parkinson's, but um, there is a good biological argument to be made that it is. And the reason is that we know there's changes in the brainstem in Parkinson's disease and the brainstem controlled breathing. So 
if there's changes in the brainstem and the brainstem controlled breathing, there's probably some changes to the breathing drive and sleep in Parkinson's too. It's specifically relevant for a, a genetic syndrome called Perry syndrome, which actually is Parkinson's plus these other things. And the treatment here really is exclusively the machine because the machine's kind of is going to regulate how you breathe in and breathe out. Um, so, so with, with central sleep apnea, again, you really need the sleep study. So, but if you have any of those symptoms of, you know, like snoring, unrestful sleep, um, morning headaches, and then, you know, that, that, that's, that's potentially a reason to talk to your doctor, get a sleep study and see whether you have obstructive sleep apnea, because um, it is something that not only affects Parkinson's, it also affects the heart um, too. And then nocturia, which is actually getting up, waking up to go to urinate, occurs. So in Parkinson's, the thing is, it, it seems to occur very, very frequently. Like there's, um, there, there are going to be conditions that will make people get up to go uh, to the bathroom, especially in men, things like uh, prostate, uh, large prostate. But it tends not to be as frequent. Like in Parkinson's, it's just very frequent. Like people wake up multiple times tonight to go to the bathroom. And... Um, it's very, very common. It's oftentimes very bothersome. Um, and it becomes more frequent as the Parkinson's progresses. And you know, if you're waking up every time, you have to go to the bathroom, it's associated with poor sleep. If you have worse sleep, you have worse quality of life. And because you're also getting up and it's nighttime, so visibility, so to speak, is, is not as optimal. It's also associated with falls and hip fractures. So a lot of these sleep-related conditions not only affect the Parkinson's, it has other effects. They have other effects too. Uh, and the uh, causes of getting up at night in Parkinson's mainly related to the bladder overactivity and hypersensitivity, which is related to the Parkinson's disease itself. But uh, Again, there are other things that need to be looked at. So if you're, you know, we, we tell patients to increase their fluid intake, but it, especially if they have low blood pressure, but then the increased fluid intake may actually make their nocturia worse. Caffeine is going to make you get up to go to the bathroom. Alcohol, same thing. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is interesting in the fact that because you're awake, if you're waking up frequently because of your breathing, there, there are people who have told me that, you know, they wake up and then they just need to go to the bathroom or they feel, oh, you know, they've woken up, they might as well go to the bathroom. And, and part of that, especially in women, is actually related to sleep apnea. Um, so, uh, so it is something to also to, to be mindful of that just frequent not awakening to go to the bathroom could actually be a sign of sleep apnea too. And low blood pressure. So if you're standing, your blood pressure is low. But when you lie down, the opposite might ha happen, where your blood pressure actually goes up. And if your blood pressure goes up, your kidney sees a lot more blood and filters more fluid. And so then you actually make more urine. And it, tying this all together is that if you're already having problems falling asleep or staying asleep, um, you're going to have... Uh, more urine production because sleep actually decreases the amount of urine you produce. So if you're not sleeping properly, you're not getting that drive to produce less urine. And so you're just going to be, again, waking up to go to the bathroom, which is going to make sleep worse. And it, again, becomes this vicious cycle, right? Um, there are other some things that the physician should also look at. So obviously other medical conditions, other urological conditions that can contribute. Um, but... Uh, in, in general, the treatment of uh, nocturia, the urologist is always there. So again, if, you're, if your doctor has tried a couple of things, nothing seems to be really working, you can always ask them to refer you to a urologist or specialist. And uh, the experience I've had in Edmonton is that they, there's actually a specific um, uh, clinic that they do some specialized testing um, so they can, they can kind of really pinpoint what the problem is. Um, and again, they have a little bit more experience using the medications too. Um, so they, they can potentially tailor the medications a little bit more precisely. Um, there are some non-medical things that can be done. So that's catheterization or adult diapers, like depends. I've seen one patient who actually had a sacral nerve stimulator placed. It wasn't too effective in that situation. 
Um, but there are actually stimulation stimulators that can be used, including once again, deep brain stimulation. Um, and whether this, the deep brain stimulation is related to actually changing, you know, like urination patterns or it's just related to improving sleep in general, it's, you know, hard, hard to, hard to really know. Cause there are multiple things that are kind of coming, coming in at play, right? Um, and medications wise, uh, the thing that I actually start um, most frequently is this medication called Mirabegron or Mirbetric. It has multiple um, advantages, I think, over the other ones. Uh, so the one thing is that uh, it doesn't get into the brain in terms of, so it doesn't really cause any cognitive symptoms. So it's not going to make you confused. It, as a side of it, it can actually boost blood pressure. And that's oftentimes an issue with Parkinson's. Um, uh, so, so those two things make it an attractive option over the anticholinergic medications like oxybutynin, tolteridine, sulfanisolotropsim. The bolded ones don't actually get into the brain too. So these, the tolteridine and the tropsim, um, should not make you confused. The other ones like oxybutynin and sulfanisolotropsim, um, the side effect it can be confusion. And in Parkinson's where cognition can be affected, don't really want to add a medication that's going to make thinking worse. Um, so that's why I really like Meribegron or Meribetric. It kind of, especially in patients who already have low blood pressure, it helps with the nocturnal urination, helps with the blood pressure. It, it works quite well in that situation. And there, there are, in some situations, botulinum toxin that can be used. So that's essentially a, a uh, like a Botox injection into the muscle and what Botox does in general is it relaxes muscles. So it's going to relax the bladder muscles and it's going to help with the frequent urination. And then um, just the last couple of things that I'll talk about, um, hallucinations and vivid dreams are closely related. They're also closely related to rep sleep behavior disorder. And the reason I'm including it in the, the sleep talk is hallucinations are typically worse at night. Um, but, uh, they can occur during the day, um, and they can be, uh, something as simple as shapes or shadows or, or something like people. And the thing where they, the reason they can affect sleep is they can be disturbing and they usually prevent sleep. So they're usually a, a thing that causes sleep maintenance or sleep initiation insomnia. They tend not to cause problems with sleep maintenance. Um, and hallucinations can be related to specific medications like Cinemet or the dopamine agonists. Um, and so one option to treat hallucinations is to cut down on how much uh, Cinemet or, you know, Rapinerol or Primapaxil you're taking at night. Again, it's a balancing act because um, the off time could, could then kind of make insomnia worse. So it's always a balancing act in, when, you cut, when you're cutting down medications. There are some treatments for hallucinations, seroclobapine. Pemavancerin is still in, uh, in the States only, um, but it is a, a, a similar medication to seroclobapine and clozapine. Um, and then vivid dreams, again, can be related to REM sleep behavior disorder. They can also be associated with daytime hallucinations and whether that's uh, related to the fact that they're related to cognition is, is, is probably the case. So if you have vivid dreams, the cognition might not be uh, kind of what it was before. And that means you're also higher, there's a higher likelihood for daytime hallucinations. And again, just like the hallucinations, they can impact sleep by being unpleasant. And because vivid dreams are thought to be a, um, a symptom of REM sleep behaviors or a manifestation of RBD, uh, decreasing nighttime dopamine and melatonin and clonazepam are the the two things that you can use. And just to finish off, so I'll talk about excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue because they're related to sleep, but they're also not related. So the idea here is that um, excessive daytime sleepiness, just like insomnia, has uh, a lot of different uh, causes. Um, so medications can make people sleepy, so especially things like dopamine agonists. A uh, big side effect of dopamine agonists like Pramipaxol or uh, Rapinerol are sleep attacks. Um, so it's actually just kind of relatively sudden, uh, essentially a phenomenon where you like relatively quickly, uh, you become very sleep and fall asleep. 
um, at kind of a, in opportune times too. So during the day, behind the wheel, that sort of thing. Um, so medications can definitely make make excessive daytime sleepiness worse and can account for part of it. Um, if the if you have insomnia at night, there's obviously going to be excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue during the day. Um, motor fluctuations, so um, just kind of being uh, stiff and slow is going to cause fatigue. If you're more fatigued, you're going to be sleepier. But if you were to account for all of those, there's also going to be an influence just of the Parkinson's itself. And the idea again is that the brainstem, which is this part of the brain that kind of deals with a breathing, um, but also with arousal, there's a, a system in the brainstem called the reticular activating system or the RAS. And that's actually the thing that wakes us up. And it's, it's it, 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 because it's in the brainstem, I mean, it, it could be affected by the Parkinson's pathology too. So there can be some changes in that system. And then that means that, you know, you, there's gonna be more fatigue and just more excessive daytime sleepiness just because of that. Um, so, so it can be related to medications, but it's also um, just a feature of Parkinson's itself. And uh, the treatment here, generally tends to be more um, more pharmacological than not, although there are some things that you can do, uh, kind of trying to be as active as possible, whether that's exercising or just even mentally active. So kind of sitting, watching TV, or doing things that are not very engaging is, is going to, it's not going to help the excessive daytime sleepiness or the fatigue. Um, but kind of keeping the brain active, keeping the body active as much as possible is going to help. Again, structure to the day, so improving um, nighttime sleep, kind of trying to uh, trying to kind of keep the day for um, for active things is it can help as well. Um, but if that doesn't work, there are several medications. Uh, modafinil I've seen used. It's we actually don't know exactly how it works. Um, it's a stimulant of some sort, but we. We're not entirely clear on which receptor it actually works, um, but I've I've seen people use it and, and and it can help and take it once or twice a day, kind of morning and then midday, and then some people I've never seen this in Parkinson's where people are actually taking things like amphetamine or methylphenidate, which is an ADHD medication. Uh, I have seen bupropion use, which is an antidepressant, uh, which actually. Um, it has a little bit of dopamine activity, so it can it can help actually with uh, not just mood, but it can actually help a little bit with movement, and it can kind of make fatigue a little bit better. And there are some studies that actually look at sodium oxabate, which is um, a medication that actually is used in narcolepsy. Um, and there are some trials that have found that it can help for excessive daytime sleep days and fatigue. And the reason it probably works is there's a proportion of people that actually have, a, I don't want to say narcolepsy per se, but a form of narcolepsy. There's a hormone that goes down and just kind of run in the mill narcolepsy that has been found to be decreased in Parkinson's too. Again, related to some degeneration in areas of the brainstem or the hypothalamus. So, 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 so the, there's even a possibility that there's a bit of an overlap between PD and narcolepsy too. And this is the reason I'm saying you can try, if you have insomnia, you try to get rid of daytime naps. But in some cases, um, you know, medications don't really do the trick. Um, you try to optimize sleep that doesn't really do the trick. So people actually taking daytime naps can also help. Um, essentially strategically placed naps, uh, uh, points in time where, you know, uh, especially if, if you're still working, you know, you're gonna come home, have a nap, and then continue throughout the day, right? So. So that is also a strategy too. Um, and I think that would be pretty much everything. Um, so we covered mainly insomnia because it's um, kind of a big component of Parkinson's, but I did touch a little bit about excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be tried. So, uh, so even if one thing doesn't work, uh, I would say that there are multiple other options. Um, even the re there's recommendate there's recommended options. Um, so there's obviously studies that have suggested, yeah, you should do this because this works. But then even just from personal experience, 
There are other medications that don't necessarily have that data that also work for some people. Um, so I didn't touch upon those because um, they're kind of more individualized. So really talking to your doctor, getting them to refer you to a specialist, um, kind of, and, and, and looking at really sleep as a whole, not just one thing, because really the, 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 all the sleep disorders are really interconnected in some way. So, so it's oftentimes not going to be uh, like a magic pill or a one quick fix type of thing. Oftentimes it's related to um, stepwise fixing components of sleep uh, and, and that over time will result in improved sleep. So it really does require a little bit of effort to, to kind of to improve overall sleep quality in Parkinson's. But like I kind of mentioned the um, improving sleep, I think in Parkinson's is, is I would say quite key. Um, so it is something that, that, you know, that, that they should definitely look at. And, and if there are slip sleep issues, try to kind of keep at it and, 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 and kind of keep talking to your doctor to try to figure out a solution. Any questions? Great. Sure well, can. thank you so much. We'll, I'll wait a couple minutes while questions uh, roll in here. But just to remind all of you viewers, we do also have another webinar tonight on Parkinson's disease and research by Dr. Ba. So that will be at 7 p.m. Um, if you do have any questions, you can throw them in the chat right now. Um, yeah. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Sakhan. Oh, thank you for having me. This is, uh, I mean, if there's, uh, you know, any need for more webinars, I'm happy to help. Happy to do more. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I mean, I can probably stop sharing it though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I know some clients talk about weighted blankets for restless leg syndrome. Do you have an opinion on, on that while we're waiting for client questions? You know what? I, it, it's part of, uh, you know, it, it, I think it kind of relates to the whole uh, compression stockings. That, so there, are, there is a study that looked at compression stocking. It's probably the same mechanism. It's some sort okay. of mechanical tactile stimulation it's it, same related really to stretching i mean some people have said that they, they'll rub their legs and that helps mm -hmm. is again this um related again to maybe some activity like like it, it's probably part of just not moving the legs but also part is, is related to sensory changes so so it's it's it kind of it, it makes sense to me that it would work mm -hmm. because it's related to the kind of putting pressure on the legs, changing the sensory input on the legs, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing is really that there's a whole variety of things that you can try. So, so if that doesn't work, there's, there are other things, right? But right. yeah, that, that it makes sense to me. It makes complete sense that that would work. Great. Thank you. Um, still not seeing any questions there um, in the chat, but uh, yeah, I'll just thank you once more for being on. I thought that was extremely informative and I know I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to going back and, and re-watching this for everything that uh, that I didn't catch the first time. So yeah, oh, and then thank you I was going to, to say that if you need the presentation, uh, but I, if it's recorded, then that's even better. Right, yes, yes, it will be. So that's perfect. And then, uh, yeah, thank you to all the, the attendees that came out and we hope that uh, this format worked well for you guys. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We'll end it there. All right. Thanks for having See me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.